Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 4. Today we're looking at verses 27 through 29. The message is entitled, Divinely Appointed Meetings. Divinely Appointed Meetings. I'm going to read those last four verses just one more time as we move into the text today. And the Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look into your word once again, we pray for your blessings upon it, that you will direct our thoughts, that you will convict us of sin, that you will bring us to repentance and to a true walk of faith, not merely a head knowledge of who you are and what you want us to do. Make us a people who are an obedient people, who move when you tell us to move, who go when you tell us to go, who stay when you tell us to stay, who walk in the way as we follow our Good Shepherd and hear the voice of the Shepherd. Make us a people who earnestly desires your will more than our will, and as a result receives your blessing instead of the chaos that we would have brought upon ourselves. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that it will go forth with power this day in the power of your Holy Spirit to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, for we pray it in his name. Amen. I recall last week a very interesting and perhaps somewhat enigmatic text as we find Moses apparently obeying God, traveling toward Egypt, stopping at a, an inn, some establishment for travelers along the way, and God is waiting for him. God had waited for him at the burning bush, but now God is waiting for him with another purpose. The Lord was waiting for him, it says, and he sought to kill him. What? A man who was trying to do the will of God, and the Lord meets him and is about to kill him? It came to pass, by the way, in the inn, that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at his feet and said, Surely a bloody husband art thou to me. So he let him go. Then she said, A bloody husband thou art because of the circumcision. We learned seven lessons. The first lesson was, never think that you are going to get away with something just because you've made a little forward progress. And we talked about the sins of omission. We think we're going forward. We think we're doing God's will. We know there's something back there that we didn't do. It was something we failed to do, but, but hey, it looks like God is blessing, and so we're moving forward. The sins of omission are serious sins. And Moses discovers that in the text. The second lesson that we learned was, don't think that you will get away with something just because God has called you and given you a new assignment. And we talked about the sins of commission. The third lesson that we learned was, don't think that God will not embarrass you in front of other people. He did it to Moses here. This was at an inn. Shame is one of the things that God uses to bring us back into line. It happened at the inn, not in some desert place. Like God had called Moses, God met him in the desert when he was about to give him marvelous signs and reveal things about himself. Nobody else got a chance to see that. But God also met him at the inn and brought him in a position of shame whereby his wife actually got angry at him because of what went on, other people were around. 
Don't think that God will not bring you to a place of shame and embarrass you if you're not walking the way that you're supposed to be walking. My dad told me a long time ago, Christian, always watch what you do because no matter where you go, there is somebody who knows you. How true I have found that out to be in my life. I think I shared with you all last week how on the way down to the burial of my dear wife in Alabama, we stopped in Salem, Roanoke area, and at random chose a motel. I was traveling with my son, who paid my way. I never stay in motels otherwise. Uh, we stopped at this motel, and as we were eating breakfast the next morning, and I was playing with the little boys, and I had shared the gospel with an elderly lady who was a waitress there, and um, I was speaking to her, and a man stopped, holding his tray of food. This was at this buffet that they had for the breakfast there, holding his food and his cup of coffee in his hand and listened to our conversation. And um, so finally I turned over and I said, yes, sir, may I help you? And he said, you're Christian Spencer, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes. He says, Paul Elliott. <laughs> Some of you know Paul Elliott. Man of God, pulled out of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church because of the apostasy that was going on there. Has written a good number of very excellent books. Has an incredible ministry. He was on his way down to Bob Jones University for a missions conference. And he had stopped there. And he, rec he said, I, I recognized your voice. Dear people, it doesn't matter. Wherever you go, there is somebody who knows you. Don't think you can get away with things because God is there and God knows what's in your heart and God knows what you're planning to do and God can bring you to shame if he wishes to do so. It happened to Moses. He was on God's mission. He was doing what he thought God had called him to do, but he'd left out something that God had called him to do. He'd refused to do it. We'll learn something about that in a second. Pagans, by the way, don't like to be embarrassed. We'll see next Sunday evening in Acts chapter 14, verses 11 through 20, where they try to kill Paul as a result. They'll try to kill you too if you embarrass them. Watch out. But God can embarrass you and there's no problem at all. The fourth lesson that we learned is God is serious about his commands, even to the point of killing you, of taking you home. He did that in the early church. You remember Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. He did that, and we're going to be coming to the Lord's table in a few moments. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says that some of those people at Corinth, they had come to the Lord's table with unconfessed sin in their lives, and as a result, God killed some of them. And some of them were very sick as a result. God is serious about his commands to the point of killing his own people. Don't ever take him for granted and think that you can ignore what he has commanded or what he has prohibited. The fifth lesson, and I think perhaps the most important lesson in this passage that we saw last week, was don't let peer pressure, or in this case, even your spouse, cause you to neglect what God has told you to do. You know what God wants? You know what the Word of God says? Zipporah knew what God had told Moses to do. But he hadn't done it with at least one of his two sons. So they're traveling to Egypt. And God meets him at the inn and says, I'm going to kill you. And Zipporah understands the reason. And she takes the sharpened instrument and cuts the foreskin off. And throws it at his feet in anger. And only then does the Lord let him go. Don't let your spouse cause you to neglect what God has told you to do. It is better to suffer the anger of a spouse than to suffer the wrath of God. Serious lesson for those of us who are married. The sixth lesson, don't assume that any of the things that God has commanded you to do are little things or insignificant things. 
They might, in fact, be a very big thing in the overall plan of God, and you don't know that. Circumcision was supposed to be the outward visible sign of males who were part of the covenant people of God. And that brought us to the final lesson, the seventh lesson last week, which is don't confuse pre-law commands with the law of Moses. We are clearly not under the law of Moses. Circumcision, however, was given before the law as a sign of God's covenant with his covenant people descended from Abraham. Now, it is restated under the law, but it actually predates the law. And both our Lord Jesus Christ made a point of that in John chapter 7, verse 22. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 8, Stephen makes a point of that in his sermon before the Sanhedrin. We're going to discuss that in more detail on April 27th, the Lord willing. Uh, and that's going to be in the evening service. I hope you can come then. When we get to the first church-wide Jerusalem council in Acts chapter 15, Lord willing, we'll be talking about that April 27th. Theologically, we explained that that is what's called a trans-dispensational principle. In other words, something may be established at one point in time that continues to remain even when God makes some changes in his household structure, which is what the word oikonomos, dispensation, is translated in the New Testament. He clearly did that at several points in Bible history. Easiest one to understand is, for example, God established marriage before the fall of Adam and Eve. And he certainly did not abolish marriage after the fall or any of the principles that he ordained for marriage. Concerning circumcision, it was clear that it was given prior to the giving of the law of Moses. It was restated under the law. But today it is permitted, though not required, after Christ fulfilled the law at the cross and the resurrection. However, the basis for circumcision after the cross is never the law. It relates to other things. For example, Paul circumcised Timothy as a testimony to the Jews who knew that his Jewish mother had married a Gentile Greek. That's Acts 16.3. However, Paul refused to circumcise Titus because the Jewish legalists wanted to make circumcision a requirement for Gentile converts. That's Galatians chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. The issue, as in almost all spiritual matters, is this. Why are you doing what you're doing? Not merely, what are you doing? Why are you doing what you are doing? We took the offering a little while ago. Why did you do it? If you did it to try to get to heaven, it's the wrong motive. If you did it because you love Jesus Christ, and you want to show your love, it's a right motive. You can do precisely the same act, and one of them is blessed, and one of them is cursed. Why are you doing what you're doing? Not merely what are you doing, although that's an important question. There can be other reasons, too, and we mentioned some last week. For example, circumcision can be a correction of a physical deformity, for cleanliness, for removal of restriction on urinary flow, for less cervical cancer in women whose husbands are circumcised, etc. But circumcision is never right as a requirement for putting a believer back under the law of Moses. It's not necessary for salvation. It is not necessary for sanctification. And we covered many passages, Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 13, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, Galatians 6, 15, 1 Corinthians 7, 18 through 20. I'm not giving, reading these all for you. But those are all passages that make it very clear that that is not something that is necessary for salvation or for sanctification. And we'll be talking about, well, what is, is this been replaced by baptism and so on? Uh, Come on April 27th in the evening service. We'll be talking about that at that time because that's a very popular thought among some folks. So why did God try to kill Moses for not circumcising his son? Because God specifically gave circumcision as a command to Moses, as a descendant of Abraham, to set the example for the Jewish people whom God was about to call out of Egypt and make a clearly distinct nation for his own. It was a visible sign in the flesh that they belonged to the covenant God, Jehovah. 
And it is rather interesting to me, recently I've been reading in my devotions in the book of Joshua, and come to Gilgal in Joshua chapter 5. And it says specifically that all the Jews who had been in Egypt, all the men of war who came out of Egypt, 600,000 men of war coming out of Egypt, all of them had been circumcised already. But all the ones who were born in the wilderness were not. And so when they crossed the Jordan River, they came to a place that got named Gilgal, which means rolling away. And it was at Gilgal that God told Joshua to have all the males circumcised to roll away their reproach before they tried to take the land. They did it just before Passover. They ate of the fruit of the land, the manna stopped, and from that point on, they ate of the fruit of the land. It's incredible. I mean, I wish I had time to, to dig into that. Those three things happened together at Gilgal. Moses had been through that experience going into Egypt where God threatened to kill him for not circumcising his son. All the Jews in Egypt were already circumcised. But they leave Egypt to become the covenant people of God and nobody circumcised in the wilderness. But God told them when they crossed the Jordan River, you better do it. You can't take the land if you don't do it. Oh, I wish we had time. That's Joshua chapter 5 if you want to read it, verses 1 through 12. And that brings us to our text for today. Divinely appointed meetings. There are ten lessons that we learn out of this. The Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Now remember verse 14, which we read just a few moments ago. Why I read that entire extended passage. In verse 14 it tells us that God said to Moses, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. In verse 14... Already, and you see all the things that happened after verse 14, God has already told Moses, Aaron is on his way to meet you. And now we're picking up the story at that point as to how Aaron happened to be going to meet him. Verse 27, here we are 13 verses later, the Lord said unto Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. The reason Aaron went was because God told Aaron to go. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And they went and gathered the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words of the Lord that had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. The first lesson that we learned from this, God can talk to more than one person at a time. Now that's a no-brainer. And we all know that in our head. That's theological truth. God can obviously speak to more than one person at a time. Simultaneous communication through his word to millions of people worldwide without confusion, without crosstalk like you sometimes get interference on the radio. This here is an illustration of that, of God's omniscience. An illustration of his omnipresence. That means that he can be speaking to you while at the same time directing someone else to have a significant intersection with your life. He's talking to you. He's speaking to you through his word. And you don't know it, but four days, five days, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, you don't know when. God has already been speaking to somebody else. We'll talk about how God speaks to us. Here's the principal way through his word. He's already talking to somebody else to have an intersection with your life. Every day you have intersection with the lives of other people. It was not by accident. God is bringing someone to intersect your life precisely at each moment where you come in contact with somebody else. What are you doing with the intersection? There are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents. And God is speaking to his people. And I, I go back to that one that just happened to me with, with Paul Elliott. That was a divine intersection in my life to give me encouragement at a point that I desperately needed it. Does God speak to his people? Does he intersect their paths? 
Does he care about us enough so that even the things that we think are small things are really part of the fabric of the infinite divine plan that God has ordained that will most perfectly in all ways glorify his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes, I believe that. And I have experienced it over and over in my life. And you will too if you are alert to what God is doing in your life. That's lesson number one. God can be speaking to you while at the same time directing someone else to have a significant intersection in your life. You may be praying about something, praying for something. And you know what? God is already in the process of answering it. Let me read this to you out of Isaiah chapter 65, verses 21 and following. This is in the context of the new heavens and the new earth, if you start back in verse 17. And he's talking about how he will bring his people back to Jerusalem and to the city and to the land. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now listen to verses 23 and 24. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth in trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Oh, I love verse 24. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. God is already at work in your life. God is already at work in my life. As he plans our futures for us, as he arranges the different events in our lives that will be for his glory and for our good. What a marvelous verse. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Moses and Aaron experienced that in our text for today. The second lesson that we learn is that God can precisely time his interacting with his people to perfectly coordinate events. I saw another illustration of that this week, where God worked in such a way that he coordinated events to happen because other things had to happen first, though I didn't know it. Some of you know, this past week I drove up to, Nat uh, up to Boston to help my oldest daughter, Natanya, move into her new apartment. And as she was getting ready to move out of Iowa, all the way to Boston, Judy died, so Natanya didn't have the opportunity of packing her own things. But the people of her church gathered around her and she gave them the keys to her apartment. She told them what things she needed and what things they could have and give away to anybody they wanted to. And ten people came from her church and began to pack all of her things in boxes. And then they, she had hired a truck. Originally, I had planned to fly out and rent a U-Haul and drive the truck for her to Boston. That obviously couldn't work at that point in time. So she found a thing called U-Pack, or U-Pack it, something like that, where they bring a, a tractor trailer to wherever you are leaving, and you put all your stuff in it, and then they put up a big wooden wall, and they pack other stuff from other people in that trailer. And then they haul it across country and deliver stuff along the way until it finally gets to your destination, and you unpack it. Well, so she had asked the people to pack it. She had no idea even what she had in the truck. Wasn't sure what they were going to send. So the truck comes across country. She had scheduled a specific day. She'd scheduled Wednesday and they guaranteed it would be there on Wednesday. So I left her on Tuesday, drove up there Tuesday night, slept on the floor, hardwood floor, not very comfortable, but hey, it was a place to stay in. In Boston, that's a tough one to find. And slept overnight. The next day we got up, waited for the truck. Didn't show up by nine, didn't show up by 10, didn't show up by 11, didn't show up by 12. She called them at 12. They said, it's not even here in our terminal. We don't even know where it is. She was not very happy. She said, well, I've got to find out when is the truck coming. 
I, she paid $125 to rent all the parking spaces in front of her apartment because they were going to have to leave that tractor trailer there so that she could unpack the tractor trailer. And she'd paid for that day. I said, sweetheart, if it's not here, go down to town hall, you know, ask them to move it a day. They'll do it for you. They did. But we used the rest of that day very profitably. If the truck had shown up that day and I had come home on Thursday, we could not have done all the things that needed to be done. And I'm not going to go through the litany of all the horrendous things that Daddy did for his daughter. But we got it done. The church that she had been attending for one Sunday up there had three men arranged to help unload the truck on Wednesday. But on Thursday, none of them could come. However, that same church found one man in the church, a young man, a journeyman electrician, who was willing to come over and help. We didn't know when the truck would be there the next day, but they said it won't come before 1 o'clock. So I took her out to lunch because that was her 40th birthday. We're eating at a Chinese restaurant. The telephone rings. <laughs> it's a trucking company saying, the truck is out in front of your apartment. So we quick called the young man who was supposed to be there. He said, actually, I'm almost there. We said, would you please talk to the driver while we get back? It takes us 15 minutes. That young man, a solid Bible-believing Christian, witnessed to that truck driver for about 20 minutes. There are no accidents in the plan of God. As soon as we got there, the truck driver left. He left with the, the thing that pulls the trailer. We wouldn't have had a chance to witness to him. But here was a young man whom God ordained to be there at that moment. He didn't know when the truck was coming. We didn't know when the truck was coming. Had God planned an intersection in the life of that young man with a truck driver from the West Coast? You know the answer. The answer is absolutely yes. That's a man who heard the gospel of Christ. The timing was precise also for the young man because he has a home Bible study that he runs in the afternoon. And so from the time that we got there until he had to leave, which was about 4.15, so we could be back for a 4.30 home Bible study, we managed to get that entire truck unpacked. I couldn't have done it by myself. She has some very heavy furniture. <laughs> but with him, we were able to get it into this bizarre floor plan apartment building. <laughs> Up eight steps to get into the first area, then through two doors, then down a step, then across a landing, then up a step, and around the corner, and around another corner. <laughs> I could not have done that. God provided a very strong young man at exactly the right time to help me get it done. Dear people, there are no incidents or accidents, only incidents in the plan of God. You know what else? That day that it arrived, that was actually her birthday, and that's why I did the lunch thing with her. I couldn't have celebrated her birthday with her if I had come home on Thursday instead of having the truck arrive on Thursday. God cares about little things. God cares about details. God cares about you. And he loves you. And he does things that are good and glorious. And he does things that comfort our hearts. And so when I came back on Friday, uh, I got as far, there's a lot of rain coming back. And uh, I got as far as the Newark area, stopped on the Garden State Parkway, and I thought, you know, it's about 7 o'clock. It's about time for the preparatory service to be going on here at the church. And the elders had told me that they would cover that for me because I knew I wasn't going to make it back on time. I thought, I think I'll take Evangeline out to dinner if she wants to go. And I called her up, and she was so excited about that. And we just started driving from the dental school, which was about 15 minutes from where I was. And uh, I said, where'd you like to go? And we were passing a Kentucky Fried Chicken. She says, I think I'd like to go there. We had a delightful time. She had just been through a major exam that morning, was totally exhausted, totally discouraged. Yet we had a wonderful time of fellowship. And she, she was rejuvenated again. Dear people, God makes the intersections in our lives. He has the timing, the location 
exactly where he wants us. Are you alert and aware of that fact? That's what's going on here. Lesson number three ties into that. God can precisely time his interacting with his people to perfectly coordinate events. And God is not obligated to anyone except to his own word. He can choose whom he wishes to use, when he wishes to use them, even without our input. Lesson number four. Our time is flying. God can give specific direction even when his commands seem to us to be very general in nature. Did you get that command that God gave to Aaron? Now, can you get any more imprecise than this? The Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. <laughs> I mean, he didn't even say, Go west, young man. You know, he said, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. That seems to us to be very, very little information upon which to go. The issue is, are you going to start moving? Are you going to trust God to direct each step of your life? Can God guide you as you begin to go? Lesson number five. Some people obey more readily at the beginning, but then later fail. For example, in our text today, here's Aaron. Aaron immediately obeys when God tells him to go. Moses had been very stubborn about it. Moses did not want to go. Moses gave every argument and excuse that he could think of. Moses gave everything from physical incapacity to I don't want to go kind of reasons. He resisted at the beginning. Aaron was compliant at the beginning. But Aaron, the compliant one, later failed. Aaron was the one who made the golden calf. Moses never made a golden calf. After he got on God's path, Moses never made a golden calf. Aaron said, yes, sure, I'll go. And then Aaron failed. Moses very stubbornly did not want to go, but later Moses went. And it shows us that God always makes the right choices for the people that he chooses to do the jobs that he wants to get done. God never makes a mistake, but he makes the right choices. You know, I'm reminded of the parable of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it occurs in multiple Gospels, but we find it over in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 21, and verses 28 through 32, I'd like to just read that for you quickly, because it illustrates what's happening in our text today. Jesus has just shot down the scribes and the Pharisees. And then he asks the question, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir. But he went not. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Are you one of those who says, oh, yes, God, I will obey you. I'll go. Are you like Aaron? And you start out the journey, but then you turn from the true and living God unto idols. Covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. Remember that. Oh, many lessons off of that. Lesson number six. God has strategic locations for bringing his people together at precisely the right time. Notice the phrase in our text today. It says, he met him at the Mount of God. It wasn't just in the wilderness. God was directing the steps of Aaron to the place where Moses was. Moses was at the Mount of God. That's Mount Horeb. That's Mount Sinai. Moses is going to be back there soon. God had met Moses at the Mount of God. It says so in the text, at the mountain of God. 
Now, God sends Aaron out. Aaron is wandering across the wilderness, and he just happens to come to the Mount of God, and that's where God has just finished speaking with Moses. It took time for Aaron to get there from Egypt. Aaron had been walking probably for several days at that point. And he probably wondered, what in the world am I doing out here? I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I'm walking, and God told me to walk, and so I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I'm walking. When's this going to happen? Where's Moses? I have no idea. This is a big wilderness. The Mount of God is not on, Mount, is not on the Sinai Peninsula. You've heard me preach on that before. Paul tells us that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Do you understand how big the Arabian Peninsula is? That's where Moses was. That's where Aaron walked. I think he walked more than a couple of days. He walked for weeks and weeks and weeks not knowing when God would bring him to the destination. Are you willing to walk by faith not merely for a couple of hours, not merely for a couple of days, not merely for a couple of weeks? Are you willing to walk in the direction that you know that God has called you to go? That's what we're talking about here. Because as soon as Moses heads toward Egypt, gets past that incident at the inn, he meets Aaron. Folks, there is a, a lesson for us all here. That's where God met Moses at the burning bush, was at the Mount of God. Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father, the priest of Midian, and led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Another lesson here. God often makes himself known unto us in what we would call obscure places. God takes us by surprise in places we would not expect to find him. Exodus 3.1 is called the backside of the desert. In Exodus 4, God says, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. God met Moses unexpectedly. God was waiting for him to corner him alone. But God sent Aaron on a very odd and seemingly irrational journey. You know, those are different forms of contact by God, and they were in different locations, but precisely tailored to accomplish the will of God. The lesson... Don't always expect God to work exactly the same way that he did in your life when you look at the lives of others. Lesson number seven. The text points out for us the phrase, and he kissed him. These are brothers who have not seen each other for over 40 years. Imagine some point in your life more than 40 years ago. Now, some of you aren't quite that old yet, so you can't imagine that far back. But most of us can imagine 40 years ago. Think about that. Now, imagine, sanctified imagination, some sibling or other loved one whom you saw for the last time 40 years ago. Can you even think of anybody that you saw for the last time 40 years ago? Now, imagine and contemplate God giving you specific directions to go to a remote location. Suppose God said to you, now I want you to go into the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, or I want you to go into central China, or I want you to go um, into the jungles of Africa, or I want you to go to the headwaters of the Amazon River. You think, that's pretty weird. But you say, I'm going to obey, and so you go. And who do you run into but the loved one that you have not seen? for 40 years. Would that be incredible? You didn't even know they were alive. Would you be excited to see him or her? 
Here we have suddenly a renewal of the old bonds of kinship, of family, of friendship, of remembrance of old times. You know, I often feel that when I see friends that I've not seen for many, many years. How much more do you think with Moses and Aaron who have both had direct contact with God telling them what to do and which way to head? Lesson number eight. In the midst of your euphoria, be careful to carry the precise message that God has given to you. Don't change it. Verse 28, Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. We see that Moses actually performs these signs as Aaron speaks those words in the front of the elders of Israel. A few verses later, perhaps a, a trial run to certify that Moses is indeed called of God. Lesson number nine, make sure you do exactly what God commanded you to do. Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. It's interesting. They'd been called to lead the children of Israel, and God used Moses to work through the ordained leadership, the divinely constituted authority to reach the children of Israel. Much we could say on that. Number ten, always be prepared to move quickly to obey when God gives direction. Your immediate response is necessary to make the intersection in the lives of others so that God's plan will move forward. I had hoped to repeat some of the material. I'm not going to have time. Our time is up at this point. But remember what we saw on Sunday evenings, the amazing illustration of that in the life of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, if you're not coming to evening services, you're missing the New Testament application of all the Old Testament principles that we're trying to set forth, we're giving you the doctrine in the morning, we're giving the New Testament practical applications of it in the evening. Well, I'm not going to have time to go on that, but Acts chapter 8, we see that uh, God did with Philip what God did here with Moses, and we have a magnificent illustration of it. Time is up for today. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. You are the God of all flesh. You so ordain our lives that as we walk, we are walking where you want us to walk. As we speak, you are speaking what you want us to speak. When we disobey, you chasten us. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Father, we thank you for that. We pray that you will help us to walk as you've called us to walk. Help us to be alert and attentive to the intersections in our lives that you are bringing about every day. Help us to be willing to move forward instead of sitting and sulking when things don't go the way we want them to go. Help us to understand that you have plans that are far beyond our feeble human comprehension and that you are accomplishing that which is not merely for our good, but for your most perfect glory. We thank you, Father, for you are a living God. You're not a dead God. You are a God who knows our uprising, our downsitting. You know our thoughts afar off. You know the intents of our hearts. You know what is good and what is bad. And you love us. Father, we thank you for that. We pray that you will take this, your word, and use it in our hearts this day. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In preparation for the Lord's table, let's take our hymn.